Hey, Lakeland. Ah, oh, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Are you excited to be here? I hope that's the same way you feel when we leave. That sounds awkward, doesn't it? But look, we're going to open up God's word. But let me ask you, it strikes me every time I hear that song, when I ask the first service, is it well with your soul today? I mean, just think about the words of such a, a, a rich song. You know, no matter what we're going through, no matter what this world throws at us, man, it's well. It's well that I could trust in a God who has everything under control. Amen. And because I know a lot of times I feel like I'm out of control. If I'm out of control, I need to trust in a God who's in control. It's well with my soul. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, turn to the book of Luke chapter 15. We're going to camp out there for the next little bit. I'm going to tell you up front that what we're getting into is not rocket surgery or brain science. It's one of those things that's pretty simple. And as I was reading through this text, it kind of, you know, it's one of those things that every time I get ready to preach, I read through a text and it smacks me upside the head. It really challenges me. And, you know, so I, I try to live this out first. First, by being convicted by what it says. Second, by paying attention to how I should live according to what it says. In order to stand before a church and say, here's what God's word says to us. So are we ready for this, church? You you good? All right, I hope so. I hope so. So we've been walking through a series called Encounters. And this is where we look at various... uh, text that where people encounter Christ and the outcome of that encounter. And my prayer this morning is that we encounter Christ himself within this text. And that we're challenged to live more like Christ and less like our own natural desires. It's tough to do. So, I, you know, I invite you as we look at this section and ask ourselves, am I living like Christ? Is my life more reflective of how Christ lived? Or am I still gravitating back to how I think I should live? So, what are some of the things we value? And here's why I asked that question, because I titled the sermon, Lost Value. Lost value. And because it'll make sense, it'll all come together hopefully later on. If not, just call me or email me. I'll say, here's why it made sense in my mind. I'll share that with you. But see, we, we value stuff and we hold on to stuff. And different things have different values to us. One of life's question is, how much, you know, is the value of this thing? How much is my car worth? You own a car for a couple of years and maybe you're ready to trade it in or sell it. How much is my car worth? Or the value of our homes. How much is my home? Did it increase in price or decrease in price? Where am I at on today's market? What's the value in my home? Or, you know, I, I hear this and I've asked this a lot recently as I'm sending kids off to college. What's the value in an education at a certain institution? You know, if I pay X amount of money, and if you haven't sent kids off to college recently, it's a lot of money. What's the value in that education? Well, what's the the return on investment? What's the value there? So we value material things, but we also value stuff like friendships. We value, you know, family. Our parents, I'm sure, are valuable to us. Our our, our children are valuable to us. You know, our siblings, eh, most of them are valuable to us. Our friends, our co-workers. Now you're going, okay, hold up, Pastor Tom. You're starting to get in the area where maybe they're not as valuable. People we go to school with, the people we see at the supermarket. How valuable are the people in our lives? How valuable do we see the people in our lives? Because, you know, do these things hold value? Sure, we can look at the market and say, my house has held value. My car has, well... Our cars hold values until we get into an accident. And then we have to deal with the insurance company. And if you're in insurance, I'm not picking on you. Just change your ways. <laughs> because you get that phone call and you say, here's my car. Here's what this car is worth. Here's what I've invested in the car. And they say, here's what we're going to pay you. And there's usually a chasm between what we think something's worth and what they think something's worth. Amen? <laughs> is it just me? Have, have you not totaled a vehicle? Okay, maybe it's me. Um, but I try not to on a regular basis. So. 
But what about the people we disagree with? Do we hold them valuable? Do we find value in those that we disagree with? And I'm not talking about our spouses. Please don't look at your husband or your wife. I'm talking about, you know, the people that might have a different political view. And in today's climate, it seems like it's us versus them or them versus us. And there's always, we're we're polarized, we're on different sides of stuff. Do we value the other people? Because when I look at this scripture, I'm smacked right upside the head with what God valued. What he saw as valuable. So Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 1, it reads like this. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they muttered. And anytime somebody mutters, you got to pay attention. They muttered, this man welcomes sinners. And he eats with them for shame. But I want to get you the whole picture. Okay, so to make sure we're on the same page, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around Jesus. And this was a big deal because the eyes of the people were on them. And these people should have avoided being around Jesus. So the tax collectors were not highly regarded for they, they both helped the, the hated Roman government and their administration to conquer the territory. But they also enriched themselves from, you know, they made their pockets fat at the expense of their fellow countrymen. They were not welcomed into this kind of situation. They were ostracized by many and and regarded as outcasts by the religious. The sinners were the immoral or those who followed occupations that the religious regarded as incompatible with the law. So we have the tax collectors and the sinners and right in the middle we have Jesus. See, neither group was held in high regard, but this portion of the gospel, the Pharisees are calling Jesus out, saying, Jesus, what are you doing? You're, you, you're with the sinners, and you're eating with them. And I love Jesus' response right here in verse 3. Then Jesus said, Jesus told them, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep till he finds it? And then when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friend and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And they transition, Jesus transitions from the sheep to the coin in verse 8 where he says, suppose a woman, so we have both genders, both losing something here, the woman has 10 silver coins and loses one, Does she, uh, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Will you pray with me? Father God, as we examine your word this morning, Lord, may we understand what your heart is and the value of the lost person. That we can understand what it is to seek out the lost as you sought out the lost. That we can see the value in the lost like you saw the value in the lost. And Lord, may you transform us that we may be different when we leave here because we've heard from you this morning. So Father, I ask, remove all the distractions. All the stuff that we can walk in here with that could distract us in the next few minutes, Lord. And Lord, if I'm one of those distractions, remove me that they may hear your voice this morning and respond to you. In your name we pray. Amen. What's the value in lost things? Have have you ever lost something? And I want to make it clear, it's not misplacing. It's a little different because I can take stuff, you know, and put it in my garage where I think I know it is six months later. Maybe my memory doesn't serve me right. Maybe it's on the other wall and I'm searching where I put it. So I've misplaced something, but lost something. See, when I come home, I put my wallet and my keys and, you know, my chapstick or whatever's in my pocket in the same spot. 
all the time. Here's where dad's spot is, you know. And so if I ever have to go get my keys, I go to my spot. You know, this is where, in fact, if I have driven my wife's car and she's looking for her keys, she goes to my spot because chances are I've put the keys there. Years ago, I'm working for an organization that we would travel all across the street and do trainings in churches and, and, and lead services in the churches. And I had the opportunity to take one of the company cars to this, to this church miles and miles away. And, and the thing is, this was budding right up to our family vacation. See, I was going to go do a training on Saturday morning, come home, gather the kids, and we were off to Disney World for a week of fun. And so we had it all planned out that I'll go do the training. I'll stop by. We'll get the other car. You follow me to the office. We'll drop the company car off and head on down the road. It sounded like a plan. The best laid plans always fail. Amen? So I come home and I set my keys down and have lunch with my wife. I make sure everything's packed. And I said, okay, let's go. I'll grab the keys to the, to the car. And I can't find the keys to the car where I just got home maybe an hour before. And usually they're where I put them. But I can't find them. They're lost. And it wasn't one of those, you know, you put them in the wrong place. I mean, they're, they're, if you're like me, every time I've lost something like that, I usually start with like checking my pockets. Like, are they in your pocket? And I got to the point where I'm, I mean, I'm pulling my pockets out. So my wife sees that I'm not just goofing off. I don't have them in my pocket, which is a good place to look because I've often lost my glasses on top of my head, okay? If you wear glasses, you feel my pain. And it, so we're searching all over. We got to the point where we took all the luggage out of the car because we could not find these keys. We've opened up the luggage thing. Maybe, just maybe, you know, we tossed them in there, you know, excited to go that we've done something. And we're always, we're reverting back to things that, you know, the bags were packed last night, you know, unless I'm David Copperfield and perform some magic, the keys magically appear in the suitcases. We're checking everything. I'm checking the microwave. I'm checking the refrigerator. I'm checking the drawers inside there because these keys, uh, you're shaking your head because you've been there. You're with me. And then I start checking the cabinets. And sure enough, I pull out the silverware drawer. And we're about four hours into the search now. And they were right there in the silverware drawer. Why? I blame my children. Because certainly I didn't come home and go, I'll just put these in here. They were lost. And because they were lost, we took the time to seek for them because there, there was something we had to do, but we couldn't get on to what we had to do because we had to find what was lost. Are you tracking with me? So there's, here's the nugget of truth. We've all been lost. We, we've all been lost. Here's the condition. Point number one, the condition. We've all been lost. Each of these accounts and these circumstances is the same. Something is lost. A sheep is lost. A coin is lost. Uh, they're just lost. They're, they're, they're not merely somewhere the owner put them and forgot about them. Each one has gone to a place. They're lost. They're not where they're supposed to be. They're separated from the rightful source. And what Jesus is getting at through the parable is the condition of mankind. This condition is that each and every one of us are born into lostness. One of the most famous Bible verses often quoted is John 3, 16. And it says, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but we'll have everlasting life. But we don't often quote John 3.17. And John 3.17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So why did Jesus not come to condemn the world? Because the world was already condemned. We were already lost. You say, how do we get lost? You know, did God design us to be lost? No, God designed paradise. And when he placed Adam and Eve into paradise, you know, the serpent comes along and, and tricks Eve to trick Adam to eat the apple. And when they ate the apple, sin entered the world, therefore causing everyone from their house being born into 
lostness. So our condition is lostness to begin with. You are lost. I was lost. And, and there had to be a solution for the lostness. And people say, why would God send someone to hell? God doesn't want people to go to hell. Our condition is we're bound for hell until something interjects. And the interjection is Jesus because God so loved the world. Are you tracking with me? And because God so loved the world, he sent his only son not to condemn us. We're already condemned. But to save us. We're condemned from the beginning. God's plan is to rescue us. Give us a path out of hell through his son, Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price. Each of us are condemned. Jesus provides the solution. The problem is people don't trust the solution. Or people haven't heard about the solution. People like to be selfish and follow their own desires. And the prophet Isaiah even speaks to this, where in Isaiah 53, 6, he says, we all, here's the theme, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned through our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. People are far from God. God sees these people as lost. And because people are doing their own thing, they're separated from Christ. And God sees us as lost. Our condition is we're lost. But the parables aren't about sheep or about coins. They're about people. More specifically, they're about spiritual lives of people. And people are spiritually lost. And one big question is why are people spiritually lost? And that's a big thing to answer. Why are people spiritually lost? I'm going to give you a few. This isn't an exhaustive list, but there's many reasons. Here's a few. Some people are lost because they're stubborn. They're stubborn. They're set in their ways and they're stubborn. They're not going to change no matter what they hear. Some people are, are, are lost because their, their life has taken a detour. And they're just not sure how to get back. Some people are lost because they've become attached to a false religion. Some people are lost because uh, they don't know the right question to ask. Some people are lost because they're just too lazy. Some people are lost because they get distracted by materialism. Some people are lost because they're rebelling against a Christian upbringing. Some people are lost because they don't realize that they're not in the right place. They're more concerned about their status or their career. They're too afraid that they're going to be judged. They, they just don't want to make a change or they're too busy. And some people are lost because they've been hurt by the church. In reality, there's thousands of reasons why people are lost. But we all, we can boil it all down to one reason. People are lost because they're sinners who need to repent. And until we repent that we're sinners, we remain lost. What that means is we can show up to church every week. We can go through the motions of being a good churchman. We can show up and do this. We can even wear the right clothes. We can sit in the right seats. But if we haven't repented of our sin and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it means we put our trust in him and in him alone, we're lost. And, and it scares me and yet saddens me that we may have churches week after week, not just Lakeland, but churches all over this country and all over this world that are full of people who are lost because they desire their own ways and not the ways of God. They're lost. We all need to repent of our sin and turn from our ways and follow Jesus. And it's not so simple. When you're lost, you don't always have the ability to be unlost. Because there's a lot of lost that haven't heard of hope in Jesus Christ. So if we're unaware of our lostness, how do we change it? Over and over through the scriptures, we Jesus looking for those who are lost. Jesus has compassion on those who are lost. Matthew 9, 35 and 36 tells us this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, of the healing of every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was willing to put his 
energy into the search. Jesus put himself into places where he could have had personal contact with people. People knew about Jesus and the tax collectors and the sinners. They gathered around what was hope. And I think the biggest reason there is because Jesus loves the lost. Point number two, the valued. So we have a condition, and there's the valued. Jesus saw the value in those others that were deemed not worthy. This man welcomes the sinners, the Pharisee says. And he even eats with them. Scandalous. A thing that is lost does not lose its value. Lost items, lost individuals still hold their value in God's economy. If they matter to God, then shouldn't they matter to us? The shepherd has a hundred sheep. Well, the shepherd had a hundred sheep at the beginning of the day when he takes them out of the pen so they could go graze and, and water. And, you know, he's taking care of the flock and he's counting, you know, 96, 97, 98, 99. We got a problem. I'm missing one. And it doesn't say he blew off the lost. It says he stopped what he was doing. And he went and he saw after the lost. The woman is cleaning her house. And maybe she's dusted the shelves where she kept the coins. And a stack of nine coins doesn't look much different than a stack of ten coins. But maybe she's moving them and she dusts and she puts them back. I don't know what the circumstance was. But all of a sudden she's like six, seven, eight, nine. We got a problem. And so she lights the lamp and she cleans the floor. And she does what she has to do to find what was lost. She understood that one was missing. And here's what we've got to understand. These were valuable things. The sheep were valuable. It was a means of trade still today and back then. Their wool provided income. You know, their meat made a tasty meal. Even though the shepherd had lost one out of a hundred, the shepherd still put his effort into finding the one. The woman had ten coins. Each coin was a reasonable amount it's not so much the amount that you could just ignore. They say, they say it's almost equal to one day's wage. And some people say it's even up to $300 each coin was worth. $300 lost is still $300. And so she searched and she searched and she searched. So there's two things at play here. And what's at play is first, both the shepherd and the woman had put into place a plan that enabled them to notice that which had been lost. So church, do we notice what's lost? Or are we too busy going about our day that we kind of just overlook the lost? So they, they put into place a plan to enable them to notice which was lost. It may have taken some time for the shepherd. It may have been like at the end of the day as he's counting the sheep. Oh, we got one lost. I've got to take care of it. And for the, the woman, it might have taken a couple of weeks as, as it's time to come around to clean whatever area of the home the, the coins were on. But she realized they were lost. So she had a plan and a, a, a way to identify something's been lost. And then the second truth is this. When they realized something was lost, they acted on it. We don't read that the shepherd counts 99 sheep and says, yeah, one's missing, no big deal. Goes about his way. We don't hear about a widow or, or the woman, excuse me, who, who, who's counting or cleaning her house and discovers one coin is missing and end of story. No, we see that they stopped what they were doing and they searched for the lost. They acted because the lost have value. So suppose... Suppose I lost a $100 bill in this room. I thought it'd be fun if I just, hey, somewhere in this room is a $100 bill. There's not. Okay. A, I don't have a $100 bill. And B, if I did, I wasn't going to use it for an illustration by saying, hey, find it. If you get it, it's yours. Here's my point. If I lost $100 in this room, even though it was lost, it was still worth how much? $100. It didn't lose its value just because I lost it. The lost don't lose their value to God just because they're lost. 
And if they, they're valuable to God, and, and not that he's saying, look, the, the shepherd stopped what he was doing to find the lost. If it's valuable enough to God that Jesus says, look, the, the woman stopped what she was doing to find the lost, then shouldn't we stop just going about our ways and start looking at the lost? Don't we have a responsibility here? Don't we have, you know, a responsibility to have compassion on what is still valuable? Jesus saw the value in those that others had deemed unworthy. And he welcomed them, and he even ate with them. And here's why, why that's significant. The religious storyline of the time said these are bad people. And bad people have no value. Even so much that one should not even choose to eat with them. Eating with these sinners or the tax collector. Yes, God? <laughs> Eating with these sinners or tax collectors was regarded as worse than merely associating with them. That means that you had welcomed them in and that they now are recognized with you. So there's a social dilemma at play. So Jesus is now being recognized as someone who welcomes in the sinners. And he is associated with the sinners. And just, I want to get the whole picture here. See, there's a pharisaical spirit going on. And where the Pharisees are saying, why would you spend time with those people? Those people. And church, I really hope we don't use that term. Those people. But I think we're right on the brink I think we're in the danger zone of going, those people. Th those people that we want to look down our nose on are valuable to God. They're just lost. And, and church, th those lost that are valuable to God, we have an answer for it. But instead, are we choosing just to be silent? To say, you know what, I'm too busy for those people. And so here's Jesus dining at the table. And it, it, just to get a whole idea, man, if I, if I go to a fancy Italian restaurant and they give me that plate that has all the herbs and the garlic and they pour the olive oil on, this is my dipping plate. You know what I'm saying? This is for my bread. It's mine. Get your own. Because I love it when you know, I get my own plate and the other people get their own plate. And then it's, you know, it's the wrestle for the bread and we're like playing, you know, breadstick you know, sword fighting over who gets the bread so we can dip it in the dipping sauce. Maybe it's just my family. Maybe I'm weird. But I'll use up the dipping sauce. This is my plate, okay, because I'm civilized. That's what we do. We're American. We're civilized. My plate, my dipping sauce. But if my dipping sauce is gone, I'm looking at my neighbor's dipping sauce. And I'm starting to covet because I'm about ready to reach over and dip my breadstick in their dipping sauce. You're like, that's weird. No, that's good. But see, we're not accustomed to that. In this day, one table, one bowl to dip in, one loaf of bread, and it's not neatly cut. They're all pulling each other. So their hands are all over the food. It's a much more social ex experiment going on than what we're used to in our clean, nice little world. These are people that you don't associate with ripping food apart, not in a barbaric way, but taking care of the food so that they can dine with one another. And Jesus is in the middle of this with the sinners and the tax collectors. And it says, and he even ate with them, which means he's breaking bread with the sinners. He's dipping the bread where the sinners dip their stuff. He's associating fully with the sinners. He's not keeping them at arm's length. He's not saying those people. In fact, he's looking at them as the same lens as his father. He's saying, my people, whose only hope is in me. And they need to know me to know that I provide the hope for mankind because their condition was much like our condition. They were lost. We were lost. We were just lucky enough to have someone get through to us and tell us about our lostness so we can repent. So this begs the question, if God so loved the world, shouldn't we? If God so loved the world, those people... Shouldn't we? This is his whole mission. Luke 19, 10, it says, For the Son of Man came and to seek 
and to save what was lost. He, that's the whole mission. And that mission of Jesus didn't go away. In fact, that mission of Jesus, he, he, he passed on to the disciples. Matthew 28, he's about to ascend to heaven. He goes, look, all the power and authority has been given to you. Therefore, go and make disciples. And I think it's funny because people say, hey, pastor, uh, I'm trying to find out what the will of God is for my life. Well, I'm going to help you. Go and make disciples. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, go and make disciples. And, and if you translate it correctly, it's more as you're going, as you do what you do, make disciples. So we, we have five banners over here on the wall that talk about a, a spiritually mature disciple. And, you know, and, and this is our pathway for helping people what it is to be a, a spiritually mature disciple. But what, what comes before all this the number one step in making a mature disciple the people have to know Jesus. I, I can't set them loose on this pathway, you know, where, where they're giving and, and, you know, where they're, you know, in the word and prayer and they're serving. If they don't know Jesus, they're not really on the pathway to being a mature disciple. So it starts with, do you know Jesus? It starts with understanding our condition of lostness, understanding our value as we still matter to God, and having us go to people and say, in order for us to go and make disciples, we have to go and share Christ with people so that they can put their trust in Jesus. And once they put their trust in Jesus, they grow in Jesus to become mature disciples. But it starts at the beginning with us going and sharing the gospel with a world that needs to hear the gospel. If God so loved the world, who decided that we shouldn't? Leads me to the third point. I love the third point because that usually means we're closer to lunch. Amen? The celebration. The celebration. There's a celebration that takes place throughout eternity when we return. See, as Jesus describes, when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, uh, when we find what is lost, there's a celebration like no other. Let's look at the original text, Luke chapter 15. We're going to pick up in verse 5, and he says, When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my sheep I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Now, I've got to be really careful how I say this. I'm so glad you're here this morning. I'm excited you're here this morning. But us just merely going through the motions of coming to church that's good. But I don't think this right here causes heaven to party. Because it says right here that there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. I love the fact that we have a rose every time we know about salvation through the church. That's an amazing thing. Because when that rose is up here representing that life, when that life is transformed, there's a party in heaven taking place. The angels are going berserk, going, whoa, yeah, it's like party time. I promise I'll never do that again. But there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party, because the Holy Ghost party don't stop, amen? And here's my passion. I want to cause heaven to party. I, I, I don't want the party to stop. And here's how we keep the party to keep going. Keep the party alive. We bring people to Christ. We bring people to Christ. Uh, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Did we catch that? More rejoicing in heaven over one sinner than the 99 who didn't need to. 
I want to cause heaven to rejoice. That's why I do what I do. That's why I've done what I've done. When I first started in the ministry, I realized that I got to join Jesus in this transformation process. And I got to lead people into a relationship with Jesus that caused heaven to party. And that gets addicting. Man, there's nothing greater than leading people to Christ and finding opportunities where we can lead people to Christ. You know, there was this separation. And we get to bring people back. And we may wonder, why is this such a big deal? And it's because, you know, how insignificant my life must be in the scope of stuff. But you know what? Someone took the time to share with me what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And now my job to fulfill the word of the will of God is to go and make disciples and help others know him as well. So here's the plea as we close. Will you join me? Because I was once lost, but now I'm found. And here's the truth. Found people find people. Found people find people, which means if you're sitting here and you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our job now is to go find others to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. And in a world where people are dying and going to hell because they don't have a relationship with Jesus, and those lives matter to God, they have value to God, they should have value to us that we are able to slow our role and what we're doing, our busyness, to share Christ with the people around us that desperately need Him. My second plea is this. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never placed your trust in Him, I want to invite you to do that. See, we're all creation of God. And that's what gives us value. But then when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we transfer our membership from creation to child of God by accepting him and trusting him and saying, Lord, you are who you say you are. You did what they say you did. And I place my life in you. They said we're born again. So if that's you and you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you're watching online and you've never done that this morning. Would you put your trust in Jesus? Maybe you've been playing the game, you've gone through the motions, and maybe you're in here with family, you might be a little too embarrassed to say, I'm going through the motions. But the greatest thing we can do is stop playing games and start playing the masquerade and saying, God, I'm all in. And we respond to being all in. Found people, find people. Now I should bow your heads with me. Let me ask you a simple question. What what is God saying to you through this message this morning? How would he have you respond? Maybe you're here and, you know, the whole idea of putting your trust in Jesus, and that's you and you want to do that. So this morning as we respond, if that's you and you want to put your trust in Jesus, I just ask you to just come forward in just a minute. We'll have prayer partners up here. We would love to do nothing more than open up God's word and show you what it means to have a personal relationship with him. Maybe you're here, and as we talked about the lost, maybe God put someone on your heart that you're like, you know what, I really need to be praying for this person and sharing with this person. I I really need to cause heaven to party because this person needs to come to Christ. We'd love to pray with you about that person. Or maybe you're walking through something else in life, maybe it's spiritual or financial or physical, and you just need prayer. In this moment, we get the opportunity to be the church and to lift each others up and pray with you in this moment. So I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I'm going to ask you to respond. Every head's bowed. Every eye is closed. Father God, these are your people. And Father God, as we go into this moment right now, we ask that you, Lord, do only what you can do in the lives of these people. May they respond to you and you alone. Lord, call those that need to be in relation with you into that relationship. Lord, call those who need to go share to go and share. But Lord, allow us to respond to you in this moment. So Father, send your Holy Spirit and let me walk through these hallways and up and down these aisles and touch the hearts and minds of everybody here that they may respond to you. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand. And as we sing this final song, if you need prayer in any area of your life, you want to know what it is to have a relationship,